And uh, it's, this has been described by the Federal Environment Commissioner as disjointed, confused, non-transparent, and weak. So, as we've heard, this project is about uh, taking oil from northern Alberta, from the oil or the tar sands, whatever you want to call it, taking that bitumen and bringing it east through Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick. Um, nobody wants to see this in their backyard or anywhere on uh, the pipeline, not the government, certainly not the landowners, certainly not even TransCanada wants to see that. But the fact is, even if we had a 100% ironclad guarantee that not one drop of oil would pollute the land and the water, the fact is the pipeline is going to be carrying a carbon bomb. So I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change. Not a lot. There should be notes on the table. And uh, if, you, if you don't get them, then talk to me. And I'm happy to send them to you. But the IPCC came out with its fifth report this fall. And it says that the warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And since the 1950s, Many of the observed changes are unprecedented over decades to millennia. The atmosphere and ocean have warmed, the amounts of snow and ice have diminished, and sea level has risen. All right, we mentioned the nasty winter we had, so it's kind of, seems kind of rude to be talking about global warming, right? Because we've had a brutal winter. <laughs> but the fact is, this was the fourth warmest January globally ever. Just not in uh, Northern Ontario. So uh, this shows, this is from the US uh, uh, National Climate Data Center. And you can see the blue is where it was below average in the last three months up to February, but mostly it's red, above average. And in fact, got some stats here. February 2014 marked the 29th consecutive February and the 348th consecutive month with a global ten temperature above the 20th, 20th century average, the last normal or actually below average temperature for any month was in February of 1985. Carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere have been monitored in Mauna Loa in Hawaii since 1958. That's what it looks like. It blew past 400 last spring. 350 parts per million is where we should be, according to uh, the best science for our stable climate. So what about Ontario? It's all fine for these experts out there. What about for Ontario? So the Ontario Environmental Commissioner said two years ago, climate change is one of the defining issues of our age and it is already having an impact on our lives. I'm not going to go into, thank you, all of the uh, data from the Environment Minister. Again, there's sheets on your table and I'm happy to share them if you want more. But basically, the impacts are occurring faster and sooner than projected and the Environmental Commissioner lists the impacts on infrastructure, public health, you name it. Weather-related disasters are happening more often and they're more expensive than the typhoon, uh, the typhoon Haiyan, droughts, wildlife impacts, wildfires. So, the IPCC uh, issued its stark warning in November. And Lord Stern, chief economist at World Bank in about 10 years ago, says, stop dithering about fossil fuel cuts. It's about time governments decide what kind of world we want to live for, leave for our children and grandchildren. So these are my children. They're a little bit older now. Kate and Emma. These are, oh, these are the constituents 
that I'm representing here. And I'm representing climate concerned Ontarians, Canadians, who feel that our voices are not being heard by the government. And the voice of scientists are not being heard by the government. I'm representing them. I'm also representing uh, Mr. and Ms. Smith, Canadian, who get up every day, go to work to put food on the table and a roof over their heads and are raising their children and don't know what the IPCC is and they don't know what CO2 levels should be and they are counting on the government to work for our common good. So I also have a sheet that lists the number of international, very small C conservative and august institutions that are raising the alarm about climate change. Okay, it's not Birkenstock wearing, tree hugging environmentalists who are like me and Tika who are saying this. It's the uh, IMF. And again, these quotes are on your table. World Economic Forum. A key challenge is the urgent need to reduce carbon emissions to avoid the catastrophic impacts of global warming. OECD. Any new fossil fuel resources brought to market, conventional or unconventional, risk taking us further away from the trajectory we need to be on. International Energy Agency developed their mandate is to monitor the petroleum industry globally. If current trends continue and we go on building high carbon energy generation, then by 2017 there will be no room to maneuver. That's three years from now. Okay, more from the IEA. The uh, Pimina Institute came out with the climate implications of the uh, Energy East pipeline. Okay, I've been given the, uh, the eight minute mark. So, um, oh. I would like no, to I, hear it's not that. To tell her if we, she asked me to do it before yes. we started. But we would like oh, to hear okay. that. Okay. <laughs> okay, don't get her into trouble. She she's, just, <laughs> she's just reminding me, which is good, because I can go on and on. But um, I think I'll just wrap up here. You have uh, the sheets on your. Uh, table like I said but I did want to uh, wrap up with a story that I uh, read recently and of course I've got too many papers on so on my table but it's uh, written by a climate concerned American called and an author called Rebecca Solnit and she was telling the story of a high-powered uh, financial executive who um, told her about when he went to work one day, had his cup of coffee in hand, he went up to the 66th floor of the office building, and he noticed when he got off the elevator that there was some sort of weird kind of almost confetti in the air. He wasn't sure what that was about, but he thought, whatever, and he went to his office and sat down and started to work. And a few minutes later, one of his colleagues came running in and said, "We, they're back, we got to get out of here and they left the south tower of the world trade center on september this was september 11th his colleague had seen the first plane go into the tower so they took the elevator down to the 40th floor lobby and when they got there there was security with the bullhorn telling them go back to your office everything is okay and some of his colleagues went back, some of them took the stairs and kept going down. And as they were taking the stairs down, over the PA system, it said, go back to your office, everything's fine, go back to your office, business as usual. So when they got to the, I think it was the ninth floor, is when the second plane hit. And everybody in the elevators, of course, was burned, and everybody um, above them. And that's when he put down his coffee cup and he.